Yep. The way they want. Yep. You know, when they all right, we're going to get going here. We're going to get started. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Evan Weiner, and uh, I was asked to put this together for December 7th, because I was talking December 7th, and uh, Pearl Harbor is attacked. And I'm going to tell you a little history about Pearl Harbor that you probably don't know, but the United States was eyeing Pearl Harbor as early as 1842 because they wanted to control the Pacific Ocean and uh, they were looking at this territory which was actually a republic called Hawaii run by a king and a queen and they decided back about 1842 this would be a great place for us to control the Pacific. Anyway, so Pearl Harbor is attacked on December 7th, 1941. John Charles Daly was the guy on radio who announced it to the world. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt. <coughs> Well, he's elected to a third term. American isolationism may or may not have been a contributing factor to Hitler's rise in Germany in the 1930s. Save our sons. No convoys, no war, no death for American boys. Join America First Committee. Help us our fight. Lindbergh, giving the Nazi salute, was literally the spokesperson of America first. Oh, there was a civil rights movement in 1941. And you could argue that uh, with World War II, the civil rights movement picked up. Uh, that is A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph was one of the organizers of the 1963 March on Washington. Uh, well, I don't have to uh, tell you who that guy is. Operation Barbarossa. Let's go and let's conquer the Soviet Union. Uh, by the way, Willie's Jeep. Who is Willie's Jeep named after? Could be this character, Eugene the Jeep from the Popeye cartoons. Citizen Kane came out in 1941. How many of you saw Citizen Kane? Bugs Bunny became a star in 1941. Joe DiMaggio, his record, 56 straight games, uh, hitting safely in 56 straight games with a hit in each game. Ted Williams, the last guy to bat in Major League Baseball, over a 400 average. Franklin Roosevelt beats Wendell Wilkie in 1940. It's his third term, uh, and he wins it on November 5th and becomes the only American president to be elected three times to that point. He got 27.3 million popular votes, about 55% of the vote, 449 electoral votes, 38 states. Wilkie got about 22.3 million votes, or 45%, 82 electoral votes in 10 states, mostly in the Midwest. FDR had a mandate. And the third term, well, welcome to Brooklyn. He was in Brooklyn campaigning uh, in 1946, about, oh, 1941, 40 rather, about uh, eight days before the uh, election. Did you see him? Did you see him? In Brownsville, Brooklyn, the motorcade. Oh, you saw the motorcade. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so he's sworn in on January 20th, and it's a mere formality. His problems remain the same as they were on January 19th. America was in isolation. But its allies in Britain were being bombed regularly by the Nazis. Japan had invaded China in 1937. A new threat is evolving to America. It's called Japan. In July 1940, Roosevelt cut off uh, shipments of scrap iron and steel and aviation fuel to Japan. Uh, although uh, he did allow some American oil to continue to flow into the empire. Japan responded by entering French Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, uh, with permission from the government of the Nazi-occupied France, uh, because at this point, 1940-41, Germany was uh, yeah. occupying France. And by cementing its alliance with Germany and Italy as a member of the Axis. American isolation is a big problem. FDR, you're preparing for war. You fight it. But if you think about American isolation, this goes back to 1924 when the Immigration Act was passed, which basically limited those people from Eastern Europe. You can figure out who the people were from Eastern Europe. 
entry, there were quotas for those people in Europe to enter the United States. America decided after uh, World War I to really go into isolation. On January 10th, looking at what's going on in England, Roosevelt introduces the Lend-Lease Program to Congress. The plan was intended to help Britain beat back Hitler's advance while keeping America only indirectly involved in World War II. The cash-strapped Brits needed airplanes, tanks, ships to uh, fight Hitler, who was going to invade. For months, the uh, British Prime Minister, Winston, Winston Churchill, Trump. begged Roosevelt to help. But he's, he's got a problem. He's got a problem with the American First Committee and others. They weren't the only one. Um, they want uh, them to stay out of the war, or Roosevelt to stay out of the war. Um, and uh, Americans want to know part of the war. Among the people who were involved in America First, Joe Kennedy, John Kennedy, Gerald Ford, among others, um, a number of people. So the Lend-Lease was very simple. Uh, it's passed on March the uh, 11th, and um, we could lend, being Americans, we could lend equipment uh, to England and others, and, uh, we're, and eventually get paid for it or get it back. So the United States could supply the United Kingdom, Soviet Union, allied nations with food, oil, and material. The isolationism is a problem. Another problem is Bund meetings, but the Bund meetings, some of them in Orange, New Jersey, some of them in Glen Rock, New Jersey, yeah. to name two places, they kind of died out. Um, and they were f French, where you thought they were French. Uh, American isolation, remember Dunkirk, I didn't raise my boy to die for Britain. Uh, Benedict Arnold tried it, treason, send Halifax to Halifax, Mother's Crusade. The Neutrality Act of 1935 prohibited exporting arms and ammunition to any foreign nation at war. 1937, the new Neutrality Act prohibited Americans from traveling on ships owned by any belligerent nation and declared that American-owned ships could not carry any arms intended for war zones. 1938, this is 20 years after World War I had ended, 70% of Americans polled believe the United States' participation in that war, World War I, was a mistake. Germany invades Poland, September 1st, 1939. Uh, two days later, France and England declare war on Germany and its ally Italy. The war in Europe was not called the Second World War, simply called the emergency at that point. Uh, Americans pulled immediately after the war began, uh, hoped for the defeat of Germany, but 90% of Americans were opposed to getting involved in war. The majority didn't even want to join the fight, even if Nazi Germany defeated Great Britain and France. All because of the America First Committee, which had enormous power, absolutely enormous power. Uh, it was founded by a bunch of Yale college students, law students, in uh, September 1940. Led by a guy by the name of R. Douglas Stewart, Jr., gathered prominent Americans to serve on the organization's board, including Henry Ford, well-known anti-Semite, Henry Ford. At its height, America First had about 800,000 members, 650 chapters. Here are some of the people that were uh, on America's First Committee. Avery Brundage. Uh, you don't know this about me, but I worked with Marty Glickman in 1988 at, with his broadcast school. And I knew Marty quite well. Marty was a football announcer for the New York Giants. Uh, also, the New York Knicks invented basketball play-by-play. -play. But for my purposes here, he was a member of the 1936 United States Olympic team. His autobiography was called Fastest Boy, Fastest, uh, Boy in Brooklyn because he can run faster than anybody else. At the age of 18, he's selected to the United States uh, Olympic team, uh, along with Sam Stoller, who I also knew. He ran the Melrose Games. And uh, they should have made the 4x4 relay. But uh, Avery Brundage and others decided, no, they didn't want to see a Jew winning a medal and embarrass the Fuhrer. That's Avery Brundage's story. And Marty hated Avery Brundage because he cost him his chance at a gold medal. Hormel Foods executive Jay Hormel 
Henry Ford, uh, President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's daughter, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, and General Hugh Johnson, who had been the director of the National Recovery Act, were all on board, along with uh, Democratic Senator Burton Wheeler of Montana, Republican Senators Gerald Nye of North Dakota, and Robert Taft of Ohio. And they were important spokesmen for the organization, but he's the guy. Lucky Lindy flies across the Atlantic, 1927. Ticker tape parade down Broadway. He's famous. And he also has Nazi leanings. Um, so he's the most prominent speaker. And even before uh, the AFC founding, uh, Lindbergh had given radio speeches opposing U.S. involvement in the war and warning of Germany's military superiority. After all, he was given a tour of Germany uh, by people like uh, Goring back around 1937-1938. Lindbergh spoke on June 20th in Los Angeles, where he criticized those who wanted to push the U.S. into war and interventionists uh, that claimed that uh, they would go to war to defend England, but they really wanted to just defeat Germany. It's December, uh, rather September 11, 1941. Lindbergh's giving a speech in Des Moines, Iowa. And he warned his listeners, the Jewish people, had too much influence on American media and government and were war agitators. Newspapers throughout the country denounced Lindbergh's speech as anti-Semitic, even though the America First Committee did not officially promote anti-Semitism the organization tolerated these sentiments among its members. So, you have Lindbergh, you have Henry Ford, you even had some KKK members at that point. But America's first uh, people, their committee, made it plain that Nazis and anti-Semites were not welcome. Henry Ford was kicked off the board for his hostility to Jews. Uh, other uh, fascist organizations, such as the Silver Shorts, the Ku Klux Klan, God. Uh, most of the U.S. Nazis were found in the ranks of the noisy German-American Bund. And the Bund, about 1937, 1938, had a rally at Madison Square Garden where about 16, 17,000 Bund members were supporting Hitler. Uh, the American First Committee didn't trust that Roosevelt would keep his pledge to stay out of the war, so it signed a petition uh, with the goal of enforcing the 1939 Neutrality Act, which would force the president to keep the U.S. from going to war. When Roosevelt's land lease bill was submitted to Congress, the American First Committee promised they would oppose it any way they could. They failed. One of the signs from um, American isolationism, no foreign entanglements. But people knew that America was going to war. Like this guy. Hey, Phil Brandoff. Know anything about him? Well, he was a unionist. He led strikes, railroad strikes. And uh, he comes after uh, uh, W.E.D. Du Bois and those people. Um, and he, in 1941, knows America is about ready to go to war. And he wants Negroes to be part of the war machine. In the spring, hundreds of thousands of whites were employed by industries mobilizing for the possible entry of the United States into World War II. But there was nothing for black workers. Jim Crow was thriving in America. So A. Philip Randolph decides we're going to have a protest. Why should we march? And 15,000 Negroes assemble in St. Louis, Missouri. 20,000 assemble in Chicago, 23,500 uh, in New York. What do they want? Well, free from want, free from fear, free from Jim Crow, equal treatment. Uh, Asa Philip Randolph, how many of you heard of Asa Philip Randolph? You have, you have, you have, okay. Was an American uh, labor unionist, civil rights activist. 1925, he organized and led the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the first successful African-American-led labor union. Planned the march on Washington on July 1st, 1941. 1941, blacks were excluded from getting jobs in the defense industry. 
Randolph began traveling the country, rallying potential marchers with a message. We, loyal Negro American citizens, demand the right to work and fight for our country. Eleanor Roosevelt supported Randolph and helped arrange an Oval Office meeting with FDR on June 18th. At that meeting, FDR tried to persuade Randolph to abandon his threat. Now, March is going to continue. It's going to be July 1st. Well, Roosevelt doesn't want that march. On June 25th, Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, banning discrimination in government and defense industry employment. The military, though, remained segregated. The Civil Rights Movement, Roosevelt, I do hereby declare that it is the duty of employees and labor organizations to provide for the full and equitable participation of all workers in defense industries without discrimination because of race, creed, color, or national origin. Well, there's a contradiction here. The fight against fascism in World War II was brought to confront the contradictions between Americans' ideal of democracy and equality, but there is that Jim Crow stuff going on, treatment of racial minorities. Meanwhile, he's on the march, and he's winning at this point, Adolf Hitler. He's been on the march since September 1st, 1939. Oh, getting back to Avery Brundage, getting back to Avery Brundage for a second. Hitler's war really starts in 1936. It's with the Olympics, the Berlin Olympics, the Hitler Olympics. Roosevelt sends the American team to compete in Munich, or rather in Berlin. The Winter Olympics was in Munich earlier that year, but Summer Olympics was the big deal in Berlin. And Roosevelt decided, even though there were people uh, like Mahoney, uh, Jeremiah Mahoney, and uh, Al Smith, and others, uh, who said we shouldn't be sending an American team to Berlin legitimizes the Nazi regime. Roosevelt said athletes shouldn't be bothered by things like this, sent the team. Uh, I asked Marty Glickman one day, I said, did you agree with Roosevelt? He said, yeah, I want to go. I want to win the gold medal. Shove it right in the Fuhrer's face. But 36 Olympics legitimized Hitler in Germany. In June of 41, Germany opened the second front, plowing straight into the heart of Russian territory. And that would be ultimately the thing that would kill off Germany. Uh, it was all European matters, so Americans said, nah, we're protected by two oceans, they're not going to come here. And uh, many believed that they were safe. There's no need for the United States to join the fight. Operation Barbarossa, the original name was Operation Fritz. Uh, during World War II, code name for the German invasion of Soviet Union, which was launched on June 22nd. Hitler invaded the Soviet Union despite an agreement between the two countries that they would not go to war with one another. It was called the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and there's Joseph Stalin watching this being signed. Uh, and uh, it's also called the German-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact of 1939, or the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, or the German-Soviet Treaty of Non-Aggression, or the Hitler-Stalin Pact, or the molotov uh, Ribbentrop Pact, August 23, 1939. Two countries agreed not to attack each other, either independently or in conjunction with other powers, not to support any third power that might attack the other power party to the pact to remain in consultation with each other upon questions touching their common interests. And again, here's the pact being signed, and there is Stalin looking over it. Not to join any groups of power directly or indirectly threatening one of the two parties to solve all differences between the two by negotiation or arbitration. It was supposed to last for 10 years, automatic extension for another five years, unless either party uh, gave notice to terminate it one year before his expiration. Of course, could you trust Hitler? Could you trust Stalin? Could you trust, are these two trustworthy guys? Following the Soviets' occupation of the Baltic and uh, of the uh, 
Bessarabian in North uh, Bukovini in uh, June of 1940, which put Soviet fo forces in proximity to Romanian oil fields on which Germany depended, Hitler's long-standing interest in overthrowing the Soviet regime starts. Let's invade Russia. He named it Operation Barbarossa after the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, who reigned between 1155 and 1190. So you're going back 750 years or so. And sought to establish German predominance in Europe. And there is uh, Hitler looking at the maps like he knew what was going on. He really didn't. Uh, Hitler and his generals originally scheduled the invasion of the USSR for mid-May. But uh, unforeseen necessary uh, necessity of invading Yugoslavia and Greece in April and forced them to postpone the Soviet campaign to late in June. Hitler and the heads of the German Army High Command, uh, the commander in chief, Wather van uh, Rastisch, and uh, his uh, chief, Fritz Hall, were convinced that the Red Army could be defeated in two or three months or by the end of October. And there would be the siege of Leningrad. By mid-November, German Army Group North had uh, completed uh, the encirclement of the city, cutting off Leningrad and its three million inhabitants from the rest of the Soviet Union. Hitler decided to uh, bypass and starve <laughs> Leningrad, uh, committing the bulk of his forces on the push to Moscow. They would never get to Moscow. And the winter, 1941-42, was one of the coldest in memory. Public utilities were in shambles. Citizens of Leningrad broke up their furniture to burn for heat. Starvation also began to take its toll. Citizens began eating glue. Wallpaper was removed from buildings in an effort to extract the adhesive paper for consumption. The siege of Leningrad. Leather belts and shoes were boiled in an attempt to make them edible. There were even reports of cannibalism. It was common for citizens in the, their weakened condition to stop for rest on their way to the jobs and factories and freeze to death. Mm -hmm. But Leningrad would eventually persevere. It's Leningrad 10 years ago when I was there. Uh, the siege would continue until 1942 and beyond. Hawaii. Mark Twain allegedly stood at that spot. Underneath there's a plaque where Mark Twain talks about the beauty of Hawaii. But you know, the Americans didn't necessarily see the beauty of Hawaii in 1842. Not at all. Uh, the U.S. Pacific Fleet relocated to Hawaiian waters in 1940. Americans had been after that area, Pearl Harbor, since 1842. Told the Brits, don't mess with it. Told the French, don't mess with it. Finally, there's Hawaiian annexation, turn of the century. And about 10 years later, Americans spent $3 million to straighten out the canal. That would be Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt told Admiral James O. Richardson, the commander in chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, that retaining the fleet in Hawaiian waters. Uh, after it concluded uh, large-scale maneuvers in spring of 1940 would exercise a restraining influence on the actions of Japan. It's 98 years after the Americans first looked at Pearl Harbor and said, it's a great place for us. Manifest destiny and all that. Despite being in alliance with Germany, Japan did not assist their invasion of the Soviet Union in June to any significant degree. Japan did sign the non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union in April. In July, uh, Japan then moved to southern Indochina, Vietnam, in, uh, in preparation for attack against both British Malaya, uh, Malaya a source for ru uh, rice, rubber, and tin in the oil-rich Dutch East Indies. This prompted Roosevelt to freeze all Japanese assets in the United States on July 26, and effectively cut Japanese access to U.S. oil. This is the guy who planned Pearl Harbor. He was Harvard-educated, Admiral Isaruku. Uh, on November 26, as U.S. officials presented the Japanese with a 10-point statement reiterating their long-standing position 
the Japanese Imperial Navy or the, the uh, Armada that included 414 planes across six aircrafts to set to sea. Following a plan devised by Admiral Yamamoto Isaruki, the flotilla aimed to destroy the U.S. Pacific Fleet in Pearl Harbor. Well, there's a meeting at the White House and um, some negotiations. Uh, the Japanese ambassador, Kichi Saburu Namori, along with his special envoy, Saburo Kurushi, meet with the Secretary of State Cordell Hull, both in November and December. The two sides are trying to avert going to war. But one of the uh, demands was, get out of China, Japan, get out of China. China, the Japanese weren't going to do that. The Americans wanted that to happen. Chiang Kai-shek assumed, in fact, uh, the other day I met a woman who knew Chiang Kai-shek. She was from uh, China. They got out of China in 1946. And uh, she was telling me about how horrible uh, the Japanese were uh, to the Chinese. On the afternoon of December 7th, uh, Kurusu told Hull, the Japanese government regrets to have to notify hereby the American government in that view of the attitude of the American government. It cannot but consider that it is impossible to reach an agreement through further negotiations. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor less than an hour later. And there is the bomb. To catch the Americans by surprise, Japanese warships maintained strict radio silence through their 3,500-mile trek from Hidokapu Bay to the predetermined launch sector 230 miles north of the Hawaiian island of Oahu. At 6 a.m., the first wave of Japanese planes lifted off from the carriers, followed by a second wave uh, an hour later, led by Captain Mitsu Fukuda. The pilots spotted land soon their attack positions around 7.30. 23 minutes later, with his bomber perched above unsuspecting American ships moored in pairs along Pearl Harbor's Battle Road, Fukuda, Fukuda uh, broke radio silence to shout, Torah, 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 Tiger, 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 the message informing the Japanese fleet that they had caught the Americans by surprise. Much of the U.S. naval fleet was damaged or destroyed. Ultimately, 2,400 Americans were killed. Americans entered the war more than two years, about 27 months after it started with Nazi Germany's invasion uh, of Poland on September 1st, 1939, December 7th. The attack commenced at 7.58 Hawaiian time. 1248 in New York. The base was attacked by 353 Imperial Japanese fighter planes, bombers, and torpedo planes in two waves, launched from six aircrafts. All eight U.S. Navy ships were damaged for some. All but the USS Arizona were later raised, and six returned to service and went on to fight the war. For nearly two hours, Japanese firepower rained down upon American ships and servicemen. While the attack did inflict destruction, significant destruction, Japan failed to uh, destroy American repair shops, fuel oil tanks, and that migrated the damage. Uh, even more significantly, no American aircraft carriers were at Pearl Harbor that day. Another picture of it. The Japanese, however, immediately followed their Pearl Harbor assaults with attacks against U.S. and British bases, Philippines, U.S., Guam, U.S., Midland Island, Wake Island, Malaya, Britain, Hong Kong, Britain. Roosevelt decided to ask, ask him about a number of things. Early in the afternoon, December 7th, Roosevelt meets with his chief foreign policy aide, Harry Hopkins, they get a telephone call from the Secretary of War, Harry, Henry Simpson, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. About 5 o'clock, following meetings with his military advisors, FDR calmly 
and decisively dictated to his secretary, Grace Tully, a request to Congress to declare war. He can't declare war. Congress can. Congress can. So he has to ask Congress. But were there lost opportunities? Could this have been averted? Historians, of course, are on the fence. In Washington, a decrypted message had alerted officials that attack was imminent moments before uh, Fukuoka's planes took to the skies. But a communications delay prevented a warning from reaching Pearl Harbor in time. The Americans missed another opportunity when an officer discounted a report from a Oahu based radar operator that a large number of planes were headed that way. Did it happen? Didn't it happen? Shrouded, still shrouded, 81 years later. Well, Roosevelt does go before Congress on December 8th, and uh, he uh, gives his speech. He calls December 7th a date which shall live in infamy. Told uh, the U.S. Congress that the nation was in grave danger. By the way, all these pictures are from Hyde Park, the FDR Presidential Library. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly attacked and deliberately uh, attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Congress voted to go to war, all but one. Congresswoman Jeanette Rankin, who was there since 1917, predated women's ability to vote. She was a pacifist, first woman in Congress, voted against the Declaration, as she did in 1917 when America went to war with Germany. Americans' isolation policy, over. Americans go to war. And it is uh, Pearl Harbor, the last time that I was there, which was in 2017. I've been there three times. Uh, over the years, all on work. Yeah, yeah all work related have been there. Territorial governor of Hawaii declared martial law. And uh, that's how you spell martial, in case you missed the news the other day. It's M A R T I A L, not M A R S H A L, as one congressman wrote it. Uh, and uh, anyway, the martial law, all authority is turned over to the military which proceeded to remove persons from military sensitive areas, set curfews, regulated night driving, censored newspapers and radio broadcasts, and put wage and price controls on everything from groceries to prostitutes. Got a question for you about the prostitute thing. Um, aren't they independent contractors? Don't they set their own rates? And do they pay taxes? Do, do, they, do they hand in 1099s? How could you set price controls on prostitutes? <laughs> so courts were closed and the writ of habeas corpus was suspended. This guy didn't grow up very far I from here. Yeah. Sergeant Hank Graber, better known as the first baseman for the Detroit Tigers. And I knew um, his son, Stephen Graber, from my days as a journalist when uh, I covered baseball. He was the deputy baseball commissioner. And uh, one day we got to talking about a whole bunch of things about his father, Hank. And uh, he was telling me, this is 1938, 1939, 1940, when he was uh, hitting, when he was batting, he would see a baseball come at him, and on that baseball was Hitler. <laughs> Hitler's face was on that baseball. He wanted to smack that baseball as hard as he could because he saw Adolf Hitler's face on the baseball. Anyway, uh, he was discharged from the Army in early December, December 5th, because he was over the age of 28. Everybody over 28, well, they were dismissed. But two days later, Pearl Harbor was attacked, and Greenberg, or Greenberg voluntarily re-enlisted and requested to be assigned to the Army Air Corps. Not the only one ready to fight. There would be others. Hitler makes it a formality on December 11th when both Germany and Italy, Mussolini, honor their pact with Japan and they declare war against the United States. 
America was quickly forced to get a military machine up and running. Yes. Building, building a military machine. Also, selling war bonds is the story of Babe Ruth. Immediately after Pearl Harbor, he wants to get fifty thousand uh, dollars for war bonds. He said, "You can't do it. Limits twenty five thousand." So, nineteen forty one, Babe gives twenty five thousand to uh, war bonds. Beginning in nineteen forty two, a new year, Babe gives another twenty five thousand. America has no divisions. For the first time in the country's history, everybody is united. Everybody is united. Um, the war changed his life. America in December 1941, 48 stars. America needed to quickly raise, train, and outfit a vast military force. At the same time, had to find a way to uh, provide military aid to its hard-pressed allies in Great Britain and now the Soviet Union. Meeting those challenges would require massive government spending, conversion of existing industries to wartime production, construction of new and huge factories, changes in consumption, restrictions on many aspects of American life, government, industry, and labor would need to cooperate. Building that war machine, remember December 7th, and you probably can't see this caricature all that well. Uh, it was a, a Japanese caricature uh, with the buck teeth, right? The, the glasses, uh, stuff that uh, would make it to cartoons. Uh, Bugs Bunny nips the nips. And that cartoon is banned today because it's offensive. It was written around 1942-43. And the character looks something like that in the cartoon. Contributions from all Americans were needed, young and old, men and women. And it would be necessary, black and white, uh, to build up what President Roosevelt called the arsenal of democracy. Now, there was this car in the military. It got people around. The 1941 Willys Jeep and Popeye? How many of you watched Popeye? I like the early Popeyes. The early Popeyes, not after it was sold out. The, the Max Fletcher Popeyes. Thimble Theater presents Popeye the Sailor and Eugene the Jeep. This is a Jeep. For those who have forgotten, the Jeep is a cute little animal living in a three-dimensional world, in this case, our world, but really belonging to a fourth-dimension world. Popeye originally found him in Africa many years ago. Eugene the Jeep. Uh, so how did the Willys MB and the Ford GPW get the name Jeep? Nobody really knows. Uh, it might have been named after Eugene the Jeep. Introduced in 1936 by the cartoonist E.C. Seeger in his popular Thimble Theater comic strip, Eugene the Jeep was the pet of Popeye. There it is. There is the Jeep. There you go, the Jeep. Eugene can only say Jeep, but he can transport into other dimensions at will. Popeye the Sailor, olive oil, and Eugene were very popular in pre-World War II America. The all-terrain uh, the all-terrain vehicle, the capabilities of the prototypes and their ability to go anywhere probably reminded the GIs of Eugene the Jeep. Uh, it was formerly called the U.S. Army Truck. Quarter ton, four by four, command uh, reconnaissance vehicle, originally designed as the Ford GPW Willys Overland MP or the G503. But the entire world would know this squared off little vehicle as the Jeep. How many of you saw Citizen Kane? Citizen Kane with Orson Welles. That's all? Just you and you? I don't remember. You don't remember? Well, it's terrific, right? Everybody's talking about it. Citizen I thought the Kane. world was coming to an end. What's this? that Kane? program, people ran No, you're thinking of War of the Worlds. This was is Citizen Kane. Orson this is, Wells? Yeah, no, that was Orson Welles. In fact, in fact, War what of the Worlds. was that? Okay, that was 38. 38? 38. War of the Worlds would lead to Wells getting a contract in Hollywood to write movies. Um, well, you know, 
it's terrific, everyone's talking about it. Well, there was a reason everybody was talking about it because Randolph Hearst, who had power, he was the powerful newspaper guy, yeah, had things like the New York Journal American here in New York, uh, didn't like the movie, thought it was about him, and decided to see if he could crush the movie. Citizen Kane, the uh, premiere of the New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, May of 41. Film was released throughout the United States later that year. Uh, it was written by Orson Welles and Herman J. Mankiewicz. It was directed by Welles, who starred in the title role. It uh, told the life story of a fictional newspaper magnate, Charles Forster Kane, widely believed, widely believed, to be based on the life of William Randolph Hearst. I've been to Hearst Castle. Actually, I should put the picture of Hearst Castle on there, too. Maybe I will. Anyway, uh, Citizens Kane was, Citizen Kane was Wells' first feature film. And he was given free reign to create the film as he wished, which was unheard of at that time. And there is uh, Wells' Citizen Kane. Hearst banned it. No advertising in his papers. No reviewing. Uh, in his papers, and he had his journalist libel, Wells. Many movie theaters, including Radio City Music Hall uh, in Manhattan, didn't show it because they thought Hearst would use his papers to put damaging stories on whatever theater in this massive newspaper uh, empire. There is Hearst. It was thought that the Hollywood gossip columnist and for the life of me, I never know why gossip columnists, be, being in the business since I've been in since 1971, why people like Winchell, uh, Walter Winchell, and in this case, uh, the Hollywood uh, gossip columnists, Heather Hopper and Luella Parts, actually, or Parsons rather, actually had any power. But it was thought that Heather Hopper, whose father, DeWolf Hopper, played Casey, Casey at the bat, uh, and Parsons alerted the Hearst organization about the movie, and Hearst and his people started the attack. The movie Dumbo. How many of you saw Dumbo? Or had your kids see Dumbo? Or your grandkids? That came out in 1941. It's Walt Disney's Dumbo. Uh, it's released by RKO Pictures on October 23rd. The main character is Jumbo Jr., an elephant, uh, who's cruelly nicknamed Dumbo, as in dumb. He's ridiculed for having big ears, but in fact, he's capable of flying by using his ears as wings. Mm. Throughout most of the film, he has only one friend aside from his mother, Timothy the Mouse, a relationship parroting the stereotypical animosity between mice and elephants. Frank Churchill and uh, Oliver Wallace scored the film, while Ned Washington wrote the lyrics to the songs for their work on the score, Churchill and Wallace, won the Academy Award for Best Original Score. Also, Walt Disney in 1941, this Red Scare started in the 1930s. Heightens a little bit in 1941. So Walt Disney is looking for communists because there is a strike at his studio, labor strike, and he branded some of his former animators as communists. Said the Screen Actors Guild was a communist front labeled a strike that hit his studio a communist plot. He even contacted the FBI about alleged communist infiltration. Bugs Bunny becomes a star, but this isn't the final Bugs Bunny. There would be more alterations. This one, he's wearing yellow gloves. Uh, Bugs Bunny becomes the main character of Warner Brothers cartoons. In Elmer's Pet Rabbit, Bugs is given his nickname on the title card. Uh, Bugs' personality is radically different from his other incarnations. It's much more aggressive, selfish, arrogant, disrespectful, almost thuggish personality. He's more sarcastic than uh, a wisecrack. I'll, I'll get this out of the way. I interviewed Joe DiMaggio a number of times. I didn't like him. I didn't like him at all. Uh, and I'm in the majority of that. He was not a nice guy. Uh, and there are many stories about it. But for this, I just want to let you know, I did not like Joe DiMaggio. But in 1941, uh, DiMaggio has a 56-game hitting streak. Got a hit on May 15th. Chicago White Sox beat the Yankees that day. 
And we get a hit in this next 55 games. The hitting streak ends on July 16th in a game against the Cleveland Indians. Ted Williams. Um, you may or may not know this name. Jerry Coleman, if you were a Yankee fan in the 1950s, you know he played second base for them. Uh, and uh, he was also an announcer, and he went out to San Diego to be a Padres announcer. And we were friendly. We were very friendly. Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Coleman, who flew missions in Korea with Ted Williams. And he told me, he said, everything John Wayne wanted to be, in, uh, everything John Wayne was in the films, Ted Williams was in real life. John Wayne was just a celluloid character. On September 28th, Boston Red Sox and Philadelphia Athletics scheduled to play a doubleheader. Williams entered the day with a batting average of 399.5, rounded up 400. But he said, I'm going to play. Uh, and he wanted to ensure that there was no doubt about his mark. Well, he was 4 for 5 in the first game, rose his average to 404. Second game, 2 for 3, that brings his average to 406. He's the last hitter in baseball to hit over 400. So here's the legacy from 1941, Germans in Europe. Um, Germany had four key fatal weaknesses. Lack of productivity of its war economy. Weak supply lines. Start of a war on two fronts. Lack of strong leadership. Now you might think of Hitler as a strong leader, but he wasn't. He made really bad decisions. Following the invasion of the Soviet Union using the Blitzkrieg tactic, um, and, and that was Edward R. Morrow, uh, you know, this is London and all that on radio, the German army marched far into Russia. However, they did so on a very slow, overextended supply lines. Uh, that was the beginning of the end for Germany. Uh, more and more scenes. The greatest generation. How many of you were married to people who served in Europe, Italy, or the Pacific, or had a parent, an <coughs> uncle, a cousin, who were in World War II at some theater? How many of you? Who, who, was, uh, who was in the... Uh, husband. Your husband. Let me ask you a question. When he came home, did he talk about his war experiences? I didn't know when he came home. I was too young. Oh, you were too, but after you married him, did he ever talk about his war experiences? Once or twice with other people. Yeah, didn't really want to talk about he it. He drove Rommel out of Africa. He was in the He's African part of the, yeah. invasion. Okay. He was a navigator. Okay, but he really didn't talk about it. Occasionally. Occasionally, but not boys, very much. To my boys. To your boys, but not very much. No. Not very much. Why was that? Wait, 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 yes. What was the question? Question, did you have a husband, a cousin, an uncle? I was a kid uh, who, when he who, was in school. My husband. Your husband, did he ever talk about in North, 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 North Africa? North Africa, but he... He wore the Silver Star in action from that. Yeah, but he did he talk about it. He spoke on the computer, Harold Wittenberg. Yeah, but did he talk about his experiences? Hmm? Did he talk about his experiences? Not a lot. Not a lot, did he I talk about it? Yeah. Did he talk about his experiences? Not much. He not much. Not, not much. Not Anybody else? He told the boys, but not so much to me. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, here's the deal. <clears throat> From what I understand, asking this question for the last 25, 30 years of World War II veterans. World War II vets had a job to do. Went to do it. They got it done. They came home. They wanted to get on with their lives. They wanted to block it out totally. There's one guy who told me a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, there was one guy who told me, he said, I had an uncle who went to World War II. He used to ask him about it. He said, when the uncle turned 80, he finally talked about World War II. It was very painful. My father-in-law, who was in North Africa and won a bronze star in North Africa, uh, very rarely talked about it. Didn't want to talk about it as much. And I found that World War II veterans, Why is that? they came home, they wanted to forget about it. They had a job to do. They did it, they went home. They didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, and the, the Greatest Generation was a book, Tom Brokaw, 2001. 
term was meant as a tribute to the resilience and patriotic spirit of those who lived through the Great Depression and fought in World War II. Hitler would commit suicide April 1945. Germany surrendered in May 1945. Japan surrendered September 2nd, 1945, not long after the Manhattan Project's two bombs hit it, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. Uh, FDR died April 12, 1945, did not see the end of the war. The soldiers came home, didn't talk about it. America's isolation policy ended. Uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, that's uh, Cordell Hull, uh, Saburo Karushi was interned in the United States at Hot Springs, Virginia, until the United States and Japan negotiated and exchanged dis diplomatic personnel and citizens in June 1942. Namanora returned to Japan in 1942. Neither was charged with war crimes. This is 1963. And this guy here in the middle is A. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King, John Lewis, the March on Washington, August 28th, 1963. A. Philip Randolph planned the 1963 March on Washington, 38 years after he organized his union. Eventually, Randolph would work with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Roy Wilkins, John Lewis, Whitney Young, and others to get everybody on the same page for the rally. The march took place August 28, 1963. At that march and rally, Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. It's terrific! Showmen, don't miss this great opportunity. Orson Welles, Citizens Kane, it's terrific. Um, well, 1941, on April 18th, 1942, Admiral Yamamoto's uh, two Mississippi, Miss, uh, it's the car, Mitsushi, uh, G4M bombers left uh, Rabul, New Guinea for a scheduled trip. This is the guy who planned Pearl Harbor. 16 P-38s intercepted the flight over Bougainville. Dogfight ensued between them and the uh, six uh, A6M zeros. Uh, First Lieutenant Rex T. Barber engaged uh, the first of two Japanese transports, which turned out to be uh, Yamamoto's aircraft. He fired on the aircraft until it began spewing smoke from its left engine. Barber turned away to attack the other transport. Uh, Yamamoto's uh, plane crashed into the jungle. He was killed. So it took America about uh, five months to catch up with the architect of the Pearl Harbor attack. Torah, Torah, Torah. Uh, 1970 film that dramatized the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. 1994 survey at the USS Arizona Memorial determined that for Americans, the film was the most common source of popular knowledge about the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, Charles Lindbergh, shown here during World War II. Um, the United States, um, the military, really didn't want very much to do with him. Um, but he was around helping train some people. Um, he's the international hero. Uh, he had the first uh, solo flight between New York and Paris. He was a skilled aviator. He was an amateur scientist, inventor, leader in the early conservation movement. But his legacy thoroughly damaged by his anti-Semitism. Orson Welles, it's terrific. Citizen Kane was nominated uh, for nine Academy Awards, one for Best Writing. Citizen Kane is considered by some to be the greatest American film of all time. Dumbo has been criticized for use of racial stereotypes. In 2017, the film was selected uh, to be kept by the United States National Film Registry, the Library of Congress, as culturally historic and uh, aesthetically significant. Bugs Bunny got his own stamp. There's Bugs Bunny. His popularity soared during World War II. Warner Brothers had become the most profitable cartoon studio in the United States. Warner Brothers pitted its characters against Adolf Hitler, 
Benito Mussolini, Francisco Franco, Goebbels, a whole bunch of others, Japanese. Bugs Bunny Nips the Nips, 1944, features Bugs at odds with a group of Japanese soldiers. This cartoon is not seen on TV. Why? Because of its depiction of Japanese people. They need to put something before the movie saying this movie was made in 1944 at a time when the United States was at war with Japan and reflects the thinking and stereotypes of that era. Joe, Joe DiMaggio, 1969, greatest living player. Sports writers gave him that 18 years after he played his last game. He would insist on being introduced as such at New York Yankees old timers game. His 56 game hitting streak has stood for more than eight decades. That is what John Wayne wanted to be, Ted Williams. Uh, 1942, after earning Major League Baseball's Triple Crown, he joined the United States Naval Reserve during World War II. He was commissioned as his second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps as an aviator in 1944. 1952, he was called back to the military to serve in the Korean War. He is a baseball Hall of Famer and considered a war hero. Nobody has batted 400 or better since William's feet in 1941. Thank you so much. Any questions? Any questions? Anybody have anything?